Thank you. Uh, it is great to be here on Home Turf, uh, and I'm here to talk about life, life as we know it. Uh, a large redisplay project here at Oxford University Museum of Natural History, uh, because this was somewhat ch cheaper than therapy. Um, life as we know it is the second phase of our overarching master plan to refresh and update our permanent displays in the museum. Phase one of that was the uh, large marine reptiles in our south court. Phase three, we're lucky for those of you in the museum, uh, we're mid installation at the moment, so you'll see some animal shaped holes in the cases just down here. And um, see if you can spot where a sunfish might eventually uh, end up in the coming weeks. Uh, uh, but I'm here to talk about phase two, which is the, the, the bit in the middle of the, the museum. The aims uh, of this master plan are to kind of improve specimen security, display conditions, as well as significantly update the context and content for our displays for the 21st century for our school groups, our HE groups, our general visitors, etc. Uh, this phase of the project started in planning in 2019, and the focus uh, for phase two was on some of our prime real estate, the central court of the museum. Uh, the most uh, impactful kind of first impression when you walk into the building, perhaps second to our architecture, the displays that most of our visitors interact with, the kind of background or set dressing for our uh, evening events, our weddings, our family activities, uh, and the springboard for some of our teaching talks and tours. A large uh, cross museum group got together to start hashing out what the main theme should be across the court and, and within each of these aisles that we have. Uh, so this is a uh, kind of whale eyes view of the 24 cases in the central court. Uh, and a key to the redisplay was to try and make explicit some of the big ideas in natural sciences that were perhaps subtext in the displays as they were before. And so we ended up deciding that the central middle aisle will be on biodiversity. Either side of that is evolution and then earth processes. And on the uh, extremes, present day and past ecosystems uh, complementing each other. Uh, across the piece, we kind of adapted this familiar content strategy used in museums online and in marketing practice uh, of talking about paddlers, divers and swimmers. Um, but instead of having those different tiers within a single display case, uh, we would uh, kind of or augment uh, each of those aisles towards these different uh, uh, kind of levels for, for exploring content. So the central aisle for the paddlers or kind of uh, showing the, the big ideas. The uh, aisles flanking either side of that for the divers, so explaining and getting more in depth, and the outermost aisles for the swimmers, so providing context beyond the big themes and top messages. This would allow us to really get our teeth into some of the more complex subjects in the diver aisles, and I do recommend you have a look at the in-progress evolution aisle, um, because there are just some wonderful things you can't really talk about unless you do have that space uh, uh, for the complexity. Uh, in this brief overview, I'll just be talking about the central aisle, Paddler's aisle, on the theme of biodiversity, I was in a working group with colleagues Scott Billings, Hilary Ketchum, and uh, Ricardo. Uh, his name I've forgotten. Uh, <laughs> I didn't, he's a very good friend. Uh, he's our head of research. We spent weeks together. Uh, Prose of Fuente. Yes, what am I? Apologies, Ricardo. Uh, I'm going to talk about biodiversity. So the approach that we took uh, as the large group was to whittle down uh, with these 12 kind of central cases, what were the 12 key things that we felt were important enough to introduce to our visitors that we could support with our collections, where perhaps some of the biggest misconceptions and misunderstandings are, and what we knew our visitors were perhaps interested in discovering more about. This slide shows a somewhat kind of fictionalized array of some of those earliest ideas, many chops and chains throughout the process. And importantly, although there were synergies between some of these cases and ideas, uh, each one really had to stand alone as because of our open space and what we know from visitor tracking uh, is we kind of lack a, a beginning and an end, uh, a, a start and a finish. People could quite freely navigate some of these spaces, so they had to stand on their own. Some of these ideas pretty much stayed as initially envisaged, others changed significantly from the kind of drawing board to the final display. And I'll be highlighting just two of these cases in the short time I have here, uh, one of which started life as one of our collection's highlight cases on mollusks and the case that eventually became uh, the Tree of Life. Uh, so first to talk about mollusk madness. Uh, this is one of the earliest kind of design prototypes. So this is when we were working things up in Word and PowerPoint for the mollusk case. This preliminary design uh, was put together by one of our extremely talented collections managers who perhaps missed a calling as a graphic designer. Uh, by proportion, mollusks, of course, make up a large chunk of the collection here uh, after arthropods, and it's the second largest phylum of animals and the most diverse when it comes to marine environments. However, unlike arthropods and vertebrates, Chordates, uh, anecdotally and from interacting with our visitors, 
Mollusks are one of the most difficult groups to conceptualize uh, as across those other major groups. There's little in the way of obvious uniting body plans, morphologies, or ecologies, uh, so much so that famously the likes of Aristotle and A.S. Cuvier uh, struggled over kind of working out the true affinities of this group. This initial idea looked at highlighting the, the extremes of diversity within mollusca uh, uh, and then following up somewhere with a secret punch. And this here is how all these animals are related. Uh, however, such a kind of circuitous route to explaining didn't really feel like a paddler's case at all. It was going to be difficult to support with the collections of the museum without considerable use of models, uh, acquisition of specimens, uh, as the vast majority of our displayable mollusks are, of course, dry shells. So we went back to the drawing board. Uh, at this stage, uh, with some steer from the steering group, uh, uh, in particular from director Paul Smith, um, he suggested, how about we marry these two concepts? Uh, so the object organizing framework, the hypercubic display of sudden understanding on the left here, an example of this principle at work uh, from the Naturalist and Science Museum, the University of Porto and the Hall of Biodiversity. The hypercubic display of sudden understanding is an aesthetic organizing principle uh, coined by Wagensberg in 2009. And it takes the familiar idea of showing, not telling, in this case applied to bird eggs organized by size, shape and color. So just by looking at this arrangement, there is an understanding of why they are in this arrangement. Of course, Molluscan shells have for decades been considered in a similar framework due to a convenient aspect of their shell morphology and growth, which can be measured, plotted, and modeled. This work on the right here, pioneered by David Rauch in the 1960s. Could we hypercube one of the most familiar natural objects, spiraled mollusks, to bring some sudden paddling understanding? Dramatic pause. Uh, certainly, in principle, we have the collections to support this. And here are some of the initial concept sketches from our designers on the project, Evie Tiger, uh, who naturalist designers do love a good organizing principle. We potentially had enough real estate for half a hypercube, which of course itself is still a cube. Uh, but what would our axes be? Classically, the Raupian dimensions of a spiral shell are W, T, and D, as shown here. However, many of us in the room know that biological reality rarely plays well with moderate perfection. In trying to conceptualize our hypercube, we were shedding potential usable, usable collections, as many mollusks have shells lost, other mollusks have shells squashed. They defy us by decorating, decorating, and other times obfuscating. They belly, bubble, and disc and bubble, and our straightened axes begin to wobble. Uh, also, strictly speaking, uh, shells with a protoconch and shells with any thickness, uh, which is technically all of them, uh, aren't truly Ralphian. But the real killer of this cube idea was the more prosaic uh, uh, and annoying biological fact that adult mollusk shells are of different sizes. Uh, not a surprising finding. So during the second session of finding shells in the collection to organize, uh, I distinctly remember the magic roundabout theme playing as Hillary and Ricardo were sorting shells along axes, measuring to find out that it was impossible to accurately fit shells along any Raupian axis, uh, axis. And when we did manage the arrangement, heavy selecting for size increases for aesthetics, uh, the selection looked near random as you've seen here. So although we couldn't make it work, we did discover a new design aesthetic, which I'm coining now into a steam company, known as the Linear Display of Persistent Non-Understanding, or the LPPN. Uh, feel free to use it with your appropriate credit in your museum displays. Uh, however, at the height of this kind of collective contra delusional transcendental experience, uh, we hit on the idea that if our case about spiral shells, what if it itself was a spiral? Uh, obviously, in this arrangement concept design here, note the kind of hopeful blank axes on the right-hand side, a uh, linear displays of persistent understanding arranging a spiral would be totally unintelligible even to backscape level explorers to return to our paddling dive and swimming model. But this loose idea of a spiral maintaining a Ralphian light organization, uh, roping the bivars back in under the loose organizing principle of degree of ornamentation, end up being our final, more paddler appropriate design while showing off some of our mask specimens and dialing back to a more generic interpretation about the natural forms. Secondly, and very quickly, the tree of life. Um, this uh, is the first prototype design here. The for this case is firstly to show the authoritative way uh, that all life as we know it is connected, but also to demystify the idea, which may have long overstayed its welcome as a trope, that there is a thing, uh, one, there's a thing as one kind of true tree of life. There are many, many trees of life which overlap, just and compete with each other. And our initial idea was perhaps was two on the nose with three trees of life with different vocal organisms as the kind of pinnacle. Uh, in researching trees of life to take inspiration from, and some of these you recognize, there wasn't really one which fit what we were looking for. And trees barely recognizable as trees to trees, perhaps too tree-like, uh, stretching the conceptual metaphor unhelpfully. Uh, what we wanted was a tree which was time-adjusted, represented all organisms of life as we know it, and included fossil data or molecular to speculative data going back in time. Very early on, in order to help people find their way in intimidating visual visualization, we wanted to highlight pairs of species tracing the last shared common ancestor up and down the tree. Uh, so what did we do? Well, we took the rather extreme step, perhaps, of making our own tree of life, 
Uh, and kudos really does go here to my colleague Ricardo. I'm who really ignored all suggestions of scientific and graphic design and possibility to bring us the tree we see on display today. Uh, pulling in published data sets, creating our own, uh, seeking advice from various internal and external experts on various branches of the tree of life is important for us to have a tree which fit our criteria. Rooted, time represented, all organismal groups, extreme, uh, extinct and extant organisms. Uh, compounding the difficulty here was trying to squash this uh, into a reasonable scale, but we felt it was really, really important that we were the authors of this tree to know where the kind of uh, hidden data bodies were, if you like, uh, to be able to explain it. Um, how's that gone down with uh, some of our visitors? Well, from our evaluation, uh, you know, hours of work have gone into this. Uh, they had a high level of enjoyment, wanted to learn more, and found it worthwhile despite their lack of detailed understanding. And we have a practically geological kind of dwell time of one minute, 13 seconds, uh, uh, which implies that people are engaging uh, with it. Uh, it takes a village to do these things. So uh, here are the many colleagues uh, who were involved in uh, this process. Uh, uh, and I'd be happy to talk about this a bit more. Uh, also, last plug, uh, one of the tours is from colleagues who will be doing a tour of the redisplay process. If you're interested in some of the other cases, do pop on to that. Thank you very much.